what what should someone you know besides the landscape of accounting make sure that they have in place in order before they could sell a, a business yeah i think there, there's probably three key things The trucking industry is crazy right now and being a broker can be stressful. Managing your invoices, billing, collecting, carrier base, and cash flow can feel like an impossible task. But I can tell you, OTR Solutions has figured out the impossible. They eliminate cash flow problems for carrier payments and ensure margin funding in just 24 hours with broker invoice factoring. OTR Solutions takes care of billing and collection processes with your shippers. And with lightning quick and accurate invoicing, your customers will never need another broker to handle their freight needs. Kick back, relax, and let OTR take care of your brokerage. If you want to know more, and I hope you do, check them out at otrsolutions.com slash freight hyphen caviar to see what they can do for your business. Or give them a call. They love to talk to brokers at 770-882-0124. We've partnered with Ascent TMS, the world's most popular and top-rated transportation management system. It's the ultimate tool for all your freight needs. You can use our referral code RA hyphen freight caviar exclamation point to receive three months of Ascent TMS for free. It only takes 20 seconds to sign up and no credit card is required. You can click the link below to learn more. Jordan, thanks for coming on the podcast. Can you give us a little short introduction on who you are and what you do for a living? Sure. Good morning. My name is Jordan Gerber. I'm a managing director at Caber Hill Advisors. Um, I'm a recovering CPA, as I like to Tell people I went to the University of Illinois, uh, Champaign, uh, started as a CPA and um, have slowly morphed my career into investment banking. So what I do is um, help owners sell their companies and and help buyers look to, to buy companies. Um, I've done a lot of work in the, the freight and trucking space, um, but also some other side uh, industries are manufacturing and financial services and um, food and beverage. So um well-rounded, industry agnostic, uh, investment banker. Very interesting. Uh, I, I recently read Built to Sell, uh, which was kind of a book that kind of, I guess, gave me somewhat of a framework on how to build a business that's sellable. I think uh, being able to build a business that's sellable is just fascinating from the point of view that even if you don't want to sell it, you don't have to technically be working on it every day. Uh, so really excited to, to dig in, to learn more about what it takes to actually build a business that's sellable. Uh, Jordan, could you kind of tell us uh, a little bit about what sparked your interest in business and finance? And uh, you went to U of I in Urbana-Champaign, same as me. So, uh, you know, we were from the same alumni, but could you just kind of tell us what, what sparked your interest in, in the whole like business and finance world? Yeah. So, I, you know, I was I was in the business school there and, and everybody kind of gets pushed towards accounting. Um, which is a great, amazing skill to have. And, and just the, the classes and the professors were incredible. And, and once I graduated, I started public accounting and, and got to see some amazing businesses with some great owners and just learned, you know, I think, I think accounting is the foundation for, for any business. It, you, even if you don't have an accounting background, you should at least understand financial statements and, and income statements and revenue and expenses. And, and it just kind of opens opens the world up to a lot of things and, and a lot of different ways to, to look at businesses. So that was always my first kind of foray into it and, and where I fell in love with kind of business and, and just watching owners build companies. Definitely. Yeah. Jordan, uh, so what you're saying is accounting. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that again? You said accounting is the most uh, like important of the business you would say, or. Yeah, I think you no know, understanding financial statements is really the key to, you know, growing your business and, and understanding what an income statement is versus a balance sheet. I mean, there's obviously a lot of important factors in running a business, but, you know, I think yeah. understanding, you know, where revenue comes from and what your expenses are, or, you know, are the key to, are always the kind of the backbone to, to making business decisions. <clears throat> Okay. It's interesting that you say that because I feel like a lot of small companies, uh, they don't really focus on that. You know, they're too focused on actually trying to grow and do things. And they're like, ah, accounting will be fine or we'll figure it out later. And they keep pushing it back and they never really pay attention to the actual numbers, you know? Yeah, I don't know. I it just seems like yeah. it. Yeah, I think that's key to 
understanding, making a decision on, on, you know, should, should we, you know, take on this, this geographical area or take on this trucking line or, you know, take this, this load or whatever it is. I mean, it really all comes down to dollars and cents. And, and I agree with you. I think people miss that when they're trying to grow their business, that they're just so quick to grab market share, especially yeah. in the food industry that they miss the, you know, how much does this actually cost or did we make money on this route or, you know, you know, I think it's important to really understand the dollars and cents. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Jordan, what are like, like, I guess, uh, to that point, some like the biggest mistakes that you see uh, trucking company owners or freight brokerage owners make uh, that like they want to sell their business, but there's an issue that arises basically like with the counting. Can you like kind of like, dig in, like, tell us like what, what should someone, you know, besides the landscape of accounting, make sure that they have in place in order before they could sell a, a business. Yeah, I think there, there's probably three key things. One is technology. I think it's important to have the the right piece of technology so you understand, you know, what's happening behind the scenes. I think a strong management team, any buyer is going to want to make sure that the management team is either in place or will continue to, to manage the business so they don't have to kind of change everything that's going on. And I think custom concentration of clients. So where is your revenue coming from? Is it all coming from one, you know, big source or, you know, do you have a diversity of clients? And I think those are really the three kind of big factors that any buyer is looking at when they're, they're looking to buy a, a trucking company. Definitely. Uh, can you t share with us a few uh, kind of uh, stories of recent transactions uh, and like what, what kind of companies they were in regards to transportation? Sure. Uh, sold a trucking company uh, a couple of years ago and, and actually, you know, it was a tricky transaction because the owner passed away in the middle of the transaction. And, and so oh, wow. that was a, um, kind of a stressful situation, but we were able to power through and the buyer was able to, to put somebody in place to, to continue running the business. And, and so that, you know, what, what could have been a stressful situation turned out to be a very successful, uh, transaction. Okay. And in terms of valuations on a trucking company, what, what are we looking at right now? How do you calculate the the price, average price of like what a trucking company could be worth? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we really look at EBITDA first. So that's, you know, earnings um, with add backs for taxes and, and depreciation. Um, it, it's a multiple. I, you know, I think we had, you touched on this earlier that, you know, there was a there was a peak in COVID where trucking companies were getting a much higher multiple. I think, I think that multiple has come down a little bit, but you know, it's anywhere from four to six times EBITDA. I hate to just kind of pinpoint, but it depends on size, um, you know, ge geography, um, synergies with, with a potential buyer. I think there's a, you know, a lot of opportunity for trucking companies to, to find the right buyer, but it, you know, it just has to be the right fit. Definitely. Uh, is there, is there a lot of trucking companies that actually try to, because I feel like it's kind of hard to sell a trucking company. Is it easier to sell a brokerage versus like a trucking company that's more of a asset heavy, you know, on the asset heavy side instead of like a broker where you you don't really have that many assets? Yeah, I, I, I think it comes down to reoccurring revenue. So if the brokerage has, you know, a, a stable of clients that they can sell, um, you know, I, I think it, it again, it fits into synergies. There's private equity firms that are buying brokerage freight brokers and and kind of rolling them up but clearly the asset side on the trucking piece is is more attractive but you know i think it just depends what the um you know we, we call the non-tangible assets are that the brokerage company has if if, if there's a, a you know reoccurring revenue or opportunities that fit into what the buyers are looking for then then you know those are those are exciting to uh, a buyer. Hey there, amazing listeners. If you're enjoying what you're hearing in our podcast, we need your support. It will only take a moment, but it would mean the world to us. Please make sure to hit the like button on this video, subscribe to our channel, and don't forget to share with one of your friends that would enjoy our content. Your engagement helps us reach more people and bring more awesome episodes to you. Thanks a million, and thanks for being part of the podcast community. So, so say I have 15, 15 trucks, I guess... <laughs> what, can, what can i sell my business for how would how would if i actually wanted to go forward like what what would be my main uh steps or how, what would be the steps i guess to get it get the ball mo moving to say if i wanted to sell, sell it out one day no we look you know so we'd come in and, and do an analysis of revenue and 
and you know the 15 trucks what what the lines what the lines look like and and what your routes look like and then you know then we would do a whole kind of internal dive on on what the opportunities are and who the buyers were we put marketing materials together take you to market and and then kind of look for either strategic players that are bigger in the space and you know, if it's LTL, other opportunities in the LTL space or um, if it's freight. Um, and then, you know, we we go out to either strategics or private equity firms that are looking to just get good companies and, and, and put them in their portfolio. And it, it depends if you're making money or not. And hopefully you are. If you went back to the earlier part where we talked about accounting and so if you, hopefully you're doing all of that right. And and there's an opportunity yeah. to get rolled up in in a bigger PE firm that's looking to do that right now. There are there's a lot of consolidation in the trucking space right now, and and so you know we would just take you to market and run a process and and hopefully find the perfect buyer. Mm -hmm. So, it, yeah. is, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I was I was going to ask is it more I was going to ask is it more common for say bigger companies to buy out the smaller companies or is it more often that you have private equity firms buying out you know, and then pull, putting all these smaller companies together and put implementing their own, I guess their own strategies and, you know, their own plans. Yeah. I, I think we're seeing a lot of both and really it, it's kind of combined. So the private equity firms are buying the bigger trucking companies who are then buying the smaller ones. So really you might think you're selling to a strategic and really, you know, at the end of the day, the money's coming from private equity. So you know, we're seeing a lot of what oh, we're calling okay. integrates, which is these that you think you're being bought by a strategic, but really the, the money is being funded by a family office or or private equity. There's also other, you know, kind of similar sized companies merging together into creating, you know, a bigger trucking company. And, and that's for, you know, myriad of reasons, geography or logistics or, you know, like I said, technology. And, and so you'll find companies of similar sizes kind of merging together to, to, to compete with the bigger boys. Okay. Interesting. And I mean, there's a lot, you know, obviously in the news, the, you know, the news with yellow and UPS, yeah. there's, a lot, but there's a lot going on in the, yeah. in the space right now. So it makes people a little nervous, but they're also nervous brings opportunities. So I think there's, you know, with what's happening with yellow, there's, there's a lot of opportunity out there for people to come and scoop up, you know, potential companies to create a bigger version of themselves. Definitely. So, <laughs> When you look at the companies, uh, Jordan, that you've worked with before in terms of selling from like the trucking side, uh, that they specialize in something specific like commodity that they have like their own like direct shippers and customers. Uh, I kind of want to like see if there's like a framework that's been more, I guess, kind of like successful from uh, when building a trucking company. Because just to give you some perspective, like Bob owns a trucking company, he's got 15 dry vans. And at the current moment, I think predominantly most of his freight is from brokers. I just wanted to see like, if like, let's say he wants to one day sell, does he have to, should he specialize in something uh, specific? Should he be hauling different kind of trailers? What, what are like, like if you were just take from your experience, what, what's kind of like maybe the framework for success in that regard? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing companies in all different types of trucking. I, I don't think you have to specialize in something. It doesn't hurt. I mean, I think if you specialize in something you might limit the buyer pool, but you might, you know, be more attractive to that smaller buyer pool. So I think it just depends on, again, what drives revenue and what drives income and, and you know, what makes you happy at the end of the day. And so I, I wouldn't build a business around eventually trying to sell it. I think you want to build a business, A, to enjoy what you're doing, B, you know, kind of provide a value and, and then C, you know, eventually you may, move to selling it, but I wouldn't drive the business around that. I would really try to build For sure. opportunity where you can and, and really, you know, again, drive revenue and then income. Definitely. Uh, and we, we, Paul, we specialize in just running a spot freight off of DAT. That's our, spe that's running our specialization, stars. you know? Yeah, moving, <laughs> yeah. moving product from A to B, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, Jordan, be before you, you became uh, managing director at Caber Hill Advisors, uh, you had your own uh, business and businesses. Uh, could you tell us a little bit, bit about your uh, business that you ended up selling, if I'm not mistaken, and kind of tell us, take us through that story of building a company that you eventually uh, were able to, to, to sell? So I was in turnaround space for a while. So I was working with trouble companies 
one of the last few companies I worked with was a collection agency. So I kind of learned the ins and outs and uh, of what not to do and how to run how to run a collection agency poorly and and took that model and and flipped it on its head and and started my own collection agency in 2000 called ATG Credit and a partner and I actually started out of his apartment um, cold calling dentists and doctors about giving us their collections and and we grew that business to about 10 million in revenue and about a million and a half of EBITDA and sold that company to private equity in 2012 and and so that was kind of my first opportunity to really get a taste of selling a business. I did not use a investment banker. I did it on my own. And oh, wow. part of me was very happy that I was able to do that on my own. And part of me, I, I, I would say I had a full head of hair before I started that, but, <laughs> um, but uh, that opportunity really got me excited about kind of transactions and how a transaction was done. Um, I then started a company called CFO Worldwide, where we were placing CFOs in businesses of all different industries and um, many of my clients were ready to sell. And I introduced them to a bunch of investment bankers and they kept coming back to me to say, Jordan, will you help us sell our business? And so that's really where I just took the leap of faith that I could do this full time and and started um, with Cabra Hill about 15 months ago. Okay. Sold Great. CFO worldwide and then started with Cabra Hill about yeah, 15 months ago. Definitely. So, and uh, Cabra Hill. All the different industries, trucking and yeah. manufacturing and distribution um you know we were just working on a variety of industries definitely so like uh in caber hill like how many i guess transportation companies do you usually like typically have to like do you have contact with like is there like do they do you have you seen like i don't know a decent amount of transportation companies uh recently like contact you for selling or how is it split up with other industries so I, I probably do six to eight transactions a year i'd say two to three of those are in the trucking space Okay. Um, you know, it kind of ebbs and flows with the economy. I think trucking follows the economy. We had, a, like I said, we had a big run up in the COVID years, and then it was a little bit of downturn. And I think trucking's on the way back up. And you know, I, 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 I equate that by how many calls I get by trucking companies that are <laughs> possibly looking to sell. So my phone is ringing again with trucking companies looking to sell. So I'm hoping they're it's on the way back up and. And I usually work with companies for about 12 to 18 months before we take them to market. Um, you know, oh, we just want to make sure the financial statements are are in order, their customer concentration is in line, the management team's in place, and, and like I said, the technology's in place. So we really try to prep them for sale before taking them to market. That We don't always have the luxury of that timeline. Sometimes there's other reasons why owners want to sell and so, you know, we just want to make sure we're, we're ready to go when, when the time is right. Definitely. That's yeah. pretty, uh, pretty neat that you help like companies prep up to get all the financials in, in place and all that. Um, uh, I'm wondering, Bob, do you have any questions right now? Cause yeah, I know my, my question is like, how, so how does that work? So say if I wanted to say hire you guys or how does that work? Do you guys take, or I've never, I mean, I've never done with this. So do you guys take the commission up front or do you take the commission after the company sell or do, is there like a process of like, Hey, this is what we charge, you know, to take your company to market. So it's a monthly retainer, small monthly retainer, just to make sure everybody's on the same page that they want us, that they want to sell. And, and we don't get paid until the close. So we're, you know, I, I quit as to like a real estate broker where, you know, we really are in a vested interest to, to get the company sold. Um, you know, we, we look at it as a, as a team where we're just an extension of, of your company, Bob, or, or whoever's company. And, and we're really out actively trying to find the perfect buyer. And, and once the transaction is done is when we get paid and it, you know, it's a percentage. It, it's hard to tell, you know, it, it just depends the size of the company. Yeah. Oh, huh. that's interesting. That's actually pretty cool, I guess, because uh, I mean, it kind of makes sense because once you sell it, then, then it makes sense instead of just trying to pay somebody and it's like, Hey, you don't know if it's going to sell or not, but yeah, I mean, there are, yeah. there are groups that kind of take a flat fee to take it to market, but they're not incentivized to, to get the company sold. And, and they'll just throw you on their website like they would with, you know, 50 other companies. And, and so we're really selective on the groups we work with. We, like I said, we only work on, I only work on six to eight deals a year. And so, uh, you know, I'm really laser focused on the company I'm working with at the time. And, and there's different, you know, a, a, you know, a transaction is probably, I'll say four to six months, four is really quick job to get something done. Um, 
but most of the yeah, on average, most of the transactions are about six months. And so I, you know, every couple of months I'll probably start with a new company while in the middle of a few transactions. So I'm fair to have three deals going on at any one time. And, and, you know, that keeps my focus on, on the end prize, which is getting the company sold and making the okay. owners happy. Uh, Jordan, uh, from the transactions that you've had, um, do most of them like involve a earnout where they get a small chunk of the money now and then they have to, I guess, earn it with with the I guess goals that the the buyer puts in place. How does that look yeah. like? Um, it depends. There, there's a, a a lot of ways to structure um, a transaction. There are an earnout is definitely one of them. If the owner thinks his company is worth more than it is. The buyer will say, you know, you know, we'll work together to try to get you maximum, maximum dollars. There's also rollover equity, which the owner can keep part of the equity if they want to, you know, stay involved. And, you know, Bob, you only want to sell 80 percent of your company. You could keep 20 percent and, and get what we call another bite of the apple. So when the when the PE firm eventually sells, then you could then you could partake in that upside of, of the increase in valuation. Um, you know, there's also a seller note where if the buyer just doesn't have all the funds at, at time of closing the the seller could finance a piece of that as well so you know there's just a lot of ways to 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 work a transaction and so it yeah. just really depends and that all that's all done through due diligence so you know once you sign a letter of intent which is the offer then you go through several months of diligence where you really the buyer really looks under the hood and, and makes sure that everything is is moving in the right direction. And, and that's really the times you start working on the transaction type. Okay. You sometimes uh, have where people sign this uh, letter of intent to sell. And then once you start, you know, getting them set up and you set sy certain system, I mean, they should already, I feel like have the systems in place. Right. But I'm sure you guys go in there, try to help them set up the system in place. And they're like, ah, maybe I shouldn't sell. Maybe I should keep it. <laughs> Cause now it's like, like you're running more legit. Do you ever have those situations? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we really try to make sure the owner doesn't get cold feet and we really try to make sure the buyer is, you know, is serious about the transaction. But, you know, there's plenty of times that something comes up that, you know, will will derail a transaction. I mean, you know, I probably I probably close 80 percent of the deals that I do. But but, you know, there's probably uh, it's probably more, maybe 90 percent. But there's, you know, one one every couple of years that doesn't close for some reason. And, and it's either buyers got cold feet or, or, I mean, sellers got cold feet or buyer found something in diligence that just didn't sit right. It just wasn't what was advertised. And so, you know, it happens like anything, it, you know, like I said, I equate it to real estate, not every house is sold. And so something comes up in inspection yeah, yeah. and it's a lot like that. So, you know, diligence is a lot like a, a really extensive inspection, house yeah, inspection. Definitely. Um, Jordan, I just say like, I called you up right now and I'm like, Jordan, I want to, I want to sell freight caviar. Can you kind of like give us like, give, give us, a, I guess, perspective of what would be like the first thing you would tell me that you need? Uh, and how, like, how would that flow kind of like, uh, I guess, of, of tasks to do would, would continue and what would I need sure. to do? I know like there's like the accounting management and all that, but, uh, and then like overall, like what kind of maybe, uh, I guess if it's a media company, but it's also niche, it's in the freight industry, like how would the, I guess, potential valuation look like on that? Sure. So first thing we do is just, you know, probably give you an intake, you know, questionnaire. We just start to learn as much as we could about your business. And then we would assess valuation. We would, you know, just determine, um, you know, for a media company, what the customer base looks like, what the number of followers are, what, what your reach is, if there's revenue opportunities, you know, you, you know, you're, I don't know if you're monetizing now, but if there's an opportunity to monetize, oh yeah, um, you know, and what the valuation is on on that, and so um, you know, the, there's a lot of ways to look at valuation. One is, you know, like I said, if there's revenue, if there's EBITDA, if there's not, we just, you know, we start looking to market. Um, if there's similar companies that sold in your space or other industries that are, you know, the leader of their their opportunity, and so. We just um, are, you know, constantly looking for ways to um, value your company. And, and here's a little trickier because, it, you know, it's media and it's it's freight niche. But, you know, there, there's ways to put a value on it. And, and I always say value is what someone will pay for it. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll yeah. start with we never really and, and it's, it's weird. We never give we'll do an internal valuation, but we never 
say here's the purchase price. We always want to see what the market will bear. And, and so we'll, we will internally talk about valuation, but we never list a company with like a purchase price on our, on our teaser or, or our deck. So, I mean, so that's what we would do with, with freight caviar to see what's there. And then once, you know, once we've gone about 30 or 40 in, in, so in, in the middle of learning about your company, we're also putting marketing materials together and we're looking for buyers. I mean, we're, you know, we've got kind of three phase in the, in, in the beginning, which is, you know, learning about your company, putting your marketing materials together and then, and then creating a buyer list. So we'll go with you and sit and say, here's what we think the buyer list looks like. And that could be anything from 20 buyers to 2000, depending on if, you know, if it's a, a niche business or a small freight line or a freight brokerage, it, it just depends, you know, what the buyer list looks like. And then, okay. and then we launch, we go to market and we send the teaser out to the 500 buyers we've, you know, we've identified and, and then we work through the process. We get NDAs back and then we send them a presentation hope in hopes of getting to, LO, well, you know, we'll have management calls and then we get an LOI sign and then we work through diligence. So that was kind of a long answer to your question. No, but, that's, I, I, I like the, the depth. $50 million <laughs> for freight caviar. Thousand dollars, Paul, thousand dollars. I got a thousand dollars right here. No. <laughs> I got a buyer. Well, Bob almost sold me uh, his Instagram account for $50,000 like a year ago. Um, and I, I yeah. think he's, I think you're happy that you didn't sell me that. <laughs> I think monthly you're, yeah. you're making pretty good off of it. So who are your, who's your follower? I could be doing, I, who's your follower base? Is it freight companies or is it everybody in the industry? Uh, so it's like trucking. Uh, it's basically drivers, dispatchers, um, trucking companies, most, mostly people like that. Okay. I have a lot of, a lot, a lot of dispatchers. Actually, I think I have more dispatchers that follow me now than I actually do have like truck drivers. Believe it or not. Yeah. Um, because I feel yeah. like my memes that are more related to dispatching, they get way more um likes than like actually like truck driving memes. You know. So. When I mentioned yeah. it to people that I know in the industry, they knew freight caviar, caviar Bob. I don't know what your your um Instagram following is, but they knew. Yeah, my they mine, knew mine is just called you. you yeah, mine is just called USA Transportation. I just okay. don't. I'm like not as professional as Paul. Paul does it a very professional way. For me, I just kind of run it as like a hobby. So it's not really like a legit business. You know, I just I started it as a hobby, and it's it's like my side gig or my side hobby type of thing. Even like he's saying about like what's nice about it for me is I have like a trucking company. So if I ever need anything, I can network through through that. You know, I met a lot of people. So it's not even. I guess about the money it's about the the connections that i can make just through that because i can make a post and like hey i need a shop in this area or hey i need something and usually people will reach out they'll connect me with the right people and it's it's been really really great in that perspective so i feel like that's what's what what's nice with like social media stuff because it just you can network with with amazing people out there yeah yeah people people yeah. were excited to hear that i was going to be on the podcast so people on the oh end, nice awesome i was asking around if, if yeah. anybody knew you guys and a lot of people did that's awesome oh well, nice yeah. glad to hear that uh it's funny because uh well i met bob through through his instagram page because like when i when i was working at a freight brokerage the, the operation we ran we'd always be laughing at bob's content and then uh one day we we're on the phone and then we got connected and he helped me grow my following on instagram and then i expanded to, to go through other uh, websites. And right now we actually, uh, well, we, we launched a SaaS product as well, Shipper CRM. So uh, it's just been, well, when you, once you have the audience, uh, I guess the sky's the limit, you know, you could, you could expand uh, into other uh, products uh, a lot easier. Cause I just post a story on Instagram or I send out like a, an email, my newsletter, we, all of our demos and we've done hundreds of demos have all just been through freight caviar. So we spend zero dollars on, on marketing, uh, which is amazing. Um, and I know Bob, if he ever came out with a product, he would be able to do the same thing. So I did, I made t-shirts and then I was like, this is not worth it. I think it's awesome what you guys are doing and it's really helpful for the industry. Yeah, it's it's been fun, and it's it's something that was unexpected because I when I left the brokerage, uh, I so a company sent me out from from Chicago to Ukraine to open up a, a brokerage, outsourced brokerage, 
Uh, they actually got acquired by Cambridge Capital back in 2021. Uh, I'm not sure if you if you know Benjamin Gordon from Cambridge Capital, but he's he does a lot of acquisitions and investments in, in the transportation space. Uh, so, but I had left Everest before that, uh, and so when I when I had left Everest, my plan was just to start a brokerage, but just moved to Poland and started from here. And then I spent all my time on, on social media, and I kind of like I was good at it, and I, I saw the audience growing, and then some sponsors came came around, wanted to sponsor content, and we grew from there. Uh, and expanded the content. So I, I, I kind of look at Morning Brew uh, as like an example of like who I want to model. Uh, I'm not sure if you know Morning Brew. Uh, yeah, so that, that's that's what I really like. It's more like like a millennial kind of media uh, site. And uh, I guess in terms of like acquisitions, like from a media standpoint, Jordan, what would you say is like kind of like minimum amount of revenue I should have per month? And then profit-wise, uh, before I, you know, want to sell the, the business. Yeah, that's a tricky question. I, you know, it's at least a hundred thousand a month in revenue, probably. I mean, or you know, a million a year in, in revenue, and then, you know, you you know, margins are high on this business because it's, yeah. it's really it's just you and, and a camera, and and so you know, if you could take home three hundred thousand of that, I think that is a good is a great start. But you know, people like I said, people will pay what the pay for something if, if, if it's there. And so, you know, followers are obviously important and especially in the trucking space, if, if it leads to something else, you know, people will pay if they see value. And so, you know, mm -hmm. revenue is, is always a nice gauge. It's an easier gauge, but yeah. definitely followers and content and, and opportunities for a buyer to, to merge you into something else would, it, it goes a long way. And so we're working with a digital marketing company right now that, works in the food and beverage space. And, and so, you know, they're a little bit bigger, they're probably 10 million revenue, but what their reach is, you know, their client base is amazing. It's the big fast food companies. And so that goes a long way for a private equity firm that may want to get, you know, you, you, you know, utilize those clients for, for some of their other businesses and especially in okay. the trucking space that, that goes a long way. Sure. And how would that compare uh, to a trucking company in terms of like, how much should Bob have in revenue and profit? Because the margins are a lot lower in the trucking side. What, what have you been typically seeing? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think again, tough question, but but five million of revenue and above is where you could start talking about, you know, looking to sell. You know, I think number of trucks is great and routes and and geography. So fifteen trucks is, is great. You know, and I think that really starts to open doors for buyers. Anything smaller than that is just too small for someone to really yeah. invest the time to kind of merge cultures because, you know, they're buying your company to put it in with their company. And so, you know, there's an effort there to, to buy someone. So I'd say five million revenue and, you know, margins are, you know, smaller, single digits yeah. on that. So maybe That's a couple fine. hundred thousand in, in net income would, would, would begin to start asking, you know, start looking, getting buyers. So just curious, uh, I know this would be an estimate and not looking for a precise answer, like, let's just say Bob has the 5 million in revenue and let's just say, I don't know, like well, the profit margins would be on that, like 3% maybe. Uh, that's probably what the trucking company Like makes. six, I would probably say. Yeah, okay. I'd say so, you have 300,000 EBITDA on 5 million probably, so. Okay, so how much, if you had 300,000 on EBITDA, like, well, what do you think he could go out to the market and get right now? So we would look to see if you know Bob was taking a salary, and we we, we would add back to that. We try to get to five hundred, at least five hundred thousand of net income, or even as what really where you want, and and it's a multiple of that, so five to seven times that plus oh, you know wow. the plus you know I mean, let's say it's five, so two and a half million dollars would would be a starting valuation, I think. And like I said, it depends on the client base and and sure. what the makeup of that five million dollars of revenue is. Okay, that's actually yeah. more than I thought it'd be, to be honest. Um, Bob, what do you think? <laughs> I I don't know. I don't pay myself a salary. I haven't paid my salary for three years because uh, I just everything has been going back into the business and everything is yeah. we're just trying to grow it and and reinvest it. But um, I'm not sure. I, it's actually very interesting, like to hear that because I'm I've never thought about. I mean, I have thought about it, but I've never like known how it works. You know, with the seller or how you multiply it or. 
So I'm I'm still kind of to be honest, I'm still kind of confused. So you would take you said my salary, like what I would be paying, and then multiply so it by so five or so how? Add back any owner, add back if you know if if you know. There's a lot of owners that aren't working 100 percent of the business. So you know, obviously, if you're an integral part of the business, we wouldn't add that back. But but sometimes the owners are taking. You know, we we, we would normalize an owner's salary. Sometimes they're paying themselves very well because they're doing really well, and so. We would normalize that salary, assuming they wouldn't stay on the business. We bring in a kind of a general manager or someone to. to so if you, if you were paying yourself three hundred thousand and we could only need a hundred fifty thousand dollars salary person, I'm just throwing numbers out there too. So yeah. you get credit for that hundred fifty thousand above your EBITDA, and if you know you had other personal expenses in there or, or one time expenses, we would add those back to try to figure out what a normal income statement would look like for your business. So let's say let, let, let me just kind of I guess uh, go go around and un, try to understand in plain terms because I'm not really like but basically say if my business did five million dollars in revenue and I paid myself a hundred thousand say say just like an even number a hundred thousand dollars a year then I would take the hundred thousand dollars a year and multiply it and then subtract it or how would that work? No, you would take your your net income. So if that's if that's all that's left at the end of the business is just what goes in your pocket, then then that's in theory your net income. So yeah, you you get a multiplier off of that, but. You know, it, it just again, it depends um, what the business is doing. And but you know, if that is kind of all that's left, the profit you put that in your pocket, then that's what we call net income. Yeah. So oh, okay. Profit. So, like, uh, for example, Bob, like, um, I guess if you pay yourself hundred thousand dollars, but yet yeah, and like, and the business still made three hundred thousand dollars that no one touches, it's in the bank business bank account. Okay. And that's like the net <laughs> yeah. profit. Uh, let's just say like that's that's what's they take into consideration when buying the business. Like uh, oh, okay. if you pay yourself a fair, fair, fair salary, the same amount as a general right. manager would, then nothing, and then and there's still yeah. some left over yeah. in the business, but right? Okay. Let's say you paid yourself $300,000. There's $300,000 left over after the year. They'll be like, okay, well you paid yourself $200,000 more than you paid typically someone. So we're going to take those 200,000 and add it to, to 300,000 because that's how much it'd be half a million dollars be left over you know, after uh, paying everyone and, you know, that's how much the business would earn. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Right, Jordan? Did, did I... sure. Yeah. And if you, if there's money you took that the company made and you reinvested into buying new trucks or, I mean, that in theory is your net income. You just bought assets with that. So we would have, again, we, we, yeah. it all goes back to the accounting. So we'd have to take a look at the income statement. And and then we factor. Jordan, I'll it. send you my I'll send you my profit and loss sheet. You can <laughs> take a look. Happy to take a look at. Jordan, could you give us like maybe I don't know, like some like accounting one one lesson for anyone that's listening that you know owns a business or wants to own a business like because like I mean I didn't take accounting. My brother actually finished accounting at U of I, but uh, just kind of like lay it out for us in term, simple terms, uh, if if possible. So, so revenue is, is the key that that's what you earn on, on, you know, your, from your customers and, and you try to keep your expenses low. And so revenue minus expenses is net income. So whatever's left after you've brought in your revenue and, and you've paid your people and your rent and your, you know, your gas and everything else that goes into running a freight company, whatever's left at the end of the day is your net income. So I, I think that's as simple as yeah. we can put that probably. Less than accounting of yeah. 101, but yeah. really you want to increase revenue and decrease expenses. That's, you know, it, it's funny. I speak on a lot of panels and and that's what I lead with it. You know, it, it, it really isn't rocket science. It's, it's just making sure you're bringing in as much revenue as you can while, while maintaining the cost. Definitely. Uh, oh. And Bob, and Bob keep, happy to look at your income statement. I, and tell you where. Uh, Bob, you keep uh, the Excel sheet, right? You have all your uh, expenses and well, revenue yeah. and expenses each month. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, Diana runs a really good uh profit and loss. I can I I mean I could send it over. You you, you could take a look at that. I don't, I don't really like try to, you know, but I but I could send it over. But we have a really good probably way better accounting than you have, Paul, to be honest. Oh, 100%. 100%. <laughs> That's so, sure. but, but, you, but my accounting's also a lot simpler. Feel... My yeah, accounting's really true. simple. Okay, yeah. I it's yeah. literally I'm the only employee and I have a couple contractors and that's it. So um yeah. Um, so, Jordan, I, guess, I have so I have another question. Do uh ever do I guess people come to you or to your uh firm and be like, hey, we're looking to buy a trucking company, or hey, we're looking to buy a brokerage? Like, do you have buyers that come and uh look for somebody that's selling? 
We do. So, so about 95% of what we do, what we do is sell side engagement. So we work with sellers, but, but every once in a while we'll work with a buyer who's motivated to, to buy what, what I, those are harder engagements for me because I equate it to like Tinder where I'll just keep bringing them deals and they'll just keep swiping right on those. So it's hard to um, keep a buyer happy and, and it just, it, it's just not worth it for us. We do a lot more sell side than we do buyer side, but we have a whole kind database of, of buyers. So we do, you know, if you wanted to sell your company at some point, we have a whole database of trucking, you know, potential buyers for, for, for you. And, and we have those in, in there, but, but occasionally people will pay us to look for companies to, to, for them to buy. Yeah. And it kind of makes sense. It's basically like a China or when you have a buyer for a real estate, you know, for a house, I used to be a realtor and, I did not like buyers because you're like showing them 20 different houses and they're like, Oh, I don't like the windows. I don't like that. And, and you're just driving around showing them houses. Uh, sorry, my phone just, uh, you're just showing mm -hmm. them houses and then, you know, they, they still, they still don't end up buying and they'll go with a different realtor. And you're like, what the heck just happened? I wasted all this time for nothing, you know? Yeah. yeah. Sell side, sell side so, easier because, because sell, sellers are motivated and buyers aren't as, you know, they say they want to buy a company, but like you said, they'll, they'll look at, 20 or 30 companies before they finally find one they like. And, and we don't get paid unless there's a, we don't really get paid unless there's a close. So for us, sell side is, is, is more, you know, is, is more enjoyable for us. There's actually, and then uh, another. Go, go ahead, bud. go ahead, Paul. No, go uh, ahead. This is going to be kind of off question. topic. You're going to go. So, uh, well, all I wanted to say is that I was just reading the book influence, which is a fairly well-known book. And in the book influence, uh, the, the author who has a PhD in psychology is giving an example of how like realtors, what they should do is they should show F, like the first two homes should be bad homes. Like where it's like the the people, the the buyers are potentially, they'll be disappointed. And then when they see that third home, it's going to be so much better than the first two that they're more likely to buy Not that third or fourth home. <laughs> <laughs> now you tell me this, now you tell me this seven years later or whatever it was, you know? <laughs> I love it. But, uh, but yeah, Bob, you were going to say um, something. Yeah, I have a question. So you said you basically do like six six to eight deals a year, I think you said, or something like that. And some of it is uh, like two or three of them are trucking companies. What are some other deals? Like what, what, what other, I guess, is this same industry or is it completely something else that you guys do uh, you deals know, on? It's, it's similar, but manufacturing, distribution. Um, I'm with a digital marketing company now. They, you know, they all have some related piece to each other. They're all, you know, they're all you know, not in trucking, but, you know, they're all people that have built businesses and, and, and want to sell most are fam, you know, all our family owned businesses and there's no next generation to, to give the business to. And, and it's, it's time to sell. So the owners are, you know, don't have a succession plan, but it's always the same story, different industry, same story. It's just uh, an owner doesn't have a succession plan and he's getting up in age and it's time, you know, it's the right time to sell. And do ever do do you ever I guess post these businesses up on like buybiz sellbiz dot com or any of these websites like I guess that's one of like the bigger websites right that that or is it mostly like hey you have a seller and then you actually go out and it never hits say the market you know what I'm saying you kind of go directly to a buyer or to the people yeah, well, that you have yeah most of them are smaller businesses on the buybiz um, dot com so broke business brokers will throw businesses up there um, we use we use a, a company called Axio A X I A L and that's a Kind of a marketplace for buyers and sellers looking you know buyers paid it to look for deals so that's kind of a sign up only we but we just don't want to throw it up on a board for anybody we have to we really like to vet the buyers first and make sure they have the funds and so you know we do all that work ourselves we're actively finding buyers ourselves instead of just throwing them up on a, a board it's hard to vet the buyers. how do you from. so how do you find a buyer though like how how would you and then five, how would you even go that route? The secret sauce. Like, I can't tell you that, Bob. Otherwise, yeah. you know, anyone will do it. So. But it's, it's, it's fascinating to learn from, uh, you know, learning about your, your side of, uh, I guess, business. Because when you mentioned Axio, uh, that, did I pronounce it correctly? Uh, Axio, yeah. Yeah. It's like, the, it's like our version of like DAT, where it's like yep. we post we post loads. And at the same time, like, you know, no broker actually wants to post loads on DAT. They do it when they're desperate and they can't find some, you know, an option for their, like, that's like uh, dedicated runs. But overall, it's like the same way uh, you want to have relationships. And so, Jordan, you probably have, you know, a list of potential buyers, private equity companies that you introduce deals to. And I'm guessing that's kind of like the framework for it. 
Uh, correct me if I'm yeah, wrong. I'm constantly meeting buyers and sellers, and you know, I'm you know, I put we put them in our CRM system. I you know, I'm, I'm really well connected with attorneys and CPAs and bankers, and they all have clients that are looking to either buy or sell companies. So those are the the best referral sources for me. Are you know, kind of either the seller or the, you know, the, the person that, you know, the, the attorney or the banker or the CPA that they would go to when they want to sell. And, and that works for all industries, not only freight, but, you know, every other industry that, you know, they'll probably call their trusted advisors when they want to sell their company. And, and that's okay. the relationship they have on the buyer side. We just do a lot of research. We have a whole back office that's constantly looking at the freight industry and freight brokers and, and what deals have been going on. And, and we just make mental notes of, you know, the other deals that are happening and, and just note when we have a client in that space to reach out to those guys and, and, you know, you know, thousands of other companies that are looking to buy. There's, there's a lot of buyers out there right now. And, and so, you know, our goal is to find the seller to, to bring them to the buyers. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, you said there's a lot of buyers right now. Can you tell us like, how has the market changed in the last 15 months since you've joined uh, Caber Hill? Yeah, I, I think the bigger deals are not going through because of interest rates. I think a lot more companies are doing what's called add-ons, which are smaller deals. So, you know, the 10 million of revenue and the 2 million of EBITDA or a million of EBITDA are, are, are going through. There's a lot of buyers sitting on cash. They have on capital, they have to deploy capital or, the, or they lose it. And, and so, you know, deals still need to get done. The, the $100 million deals, the $500 million deals are, are not getting done as quickly as the smaller deals now. And so you find a lot of buyers, even the bigger buyers are moving downstream into, into freight, you know, smaller freight deals that, that they might not have looked at, if, you know, 15 months ago or two years ago or when, co you know, during hmm. COVID. Definitely. That's very That's interesting. interesting. I thought, yeah. I thought the market would have been, a little bit uh, worse or drier at the moment, but that's 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 good to hear. You know, it, I, again, I, I, I equate a lot of my stuff to the real estate market. There's not as much how there's not as many houses out there, mm -hmm. but there's a ton of people looking to buy houses, and so okay. yeah, there, there's not as many you know great companies selling out there, but there's a lot of people looking to buy companies. So if you have a good company, a good freight company, a good any company, it's a great time to sell right now. Wow. Ooh, wow. call me, should look call me if it. you want, Bob. After this, and <laughs> maybe yeah. I should look into it. Yeah, yeah I was gonna say. I mean, I, we don't. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Uh, we don't. I don't. We, we don't have five million dollars even in revenue. Yeah, I don't think we hit that number. I have to take a look, but I don't think we're we're even at that point yet. What's your average truck? So, you know, you know your average truck is doing uh, a year or a month or. Uh, so I I think a month we're basically doing almost a hundred thousand in revenue. If I'm not okay. mistaken. Sure. So it's like one point. Right. No, a week. Sorry, not a month. A week. Each I'm, I'm mistaken. No, it it's a week. Each, each truck. Yeah. Do no, no, not each truck. No, not each truck. The company. No, no not each truck. Uh, the company. So that way, yeah, the then you have five point two million in revenue. Yeah. This year, I think we're on a target to hit that. Yep. Oh, it's good. It's a great spot. So. Yeah. So yeah. Bob, you could sell. Maybe I maybe I will give you maybe I will give you a good call. Where are your trucks? Bob, where are your trucks running? Where, is that? where are your trucks running? Um, they're running stars are all over the country, like I said in my other podcasts. Right now we don't have any like dedicated stuff, but some of ours kind of run to West Coast and back, and then uh the other ones kind of just do Midwest. We don't really go he's, to like New Jersey area. We don't yeah. go to like but you're based out, he's based out of Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, because uh yeah, Jordan didn't yeah. Go we're based out of Charlotte. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And like all your drivers come back to Charlotte every week, don't they? For the most part. Um, a lot of them do. And that's where we're kind of running into a problem right now is uh, so when we first started, our drivers would take the trucks home and then every time they would go because they stay on for three weeks and then go home for a week. So they would take their truck and actually park it at their house. But now we have a lot of people that actually are like from Spartanburg area and from Charlotte and they actually have to park the truck in Charlotte. And Charlotte is super. They don't like trucking companies here i feel like so that it's super hard to like find a spot to park the trucks and we don't have like our office space we don't have like truck parking in the back and like yesterday i got a, a thing from our hoa saying we can't park semi trucks here anymore i'm like come on <laughs> so that's like it's, a, another, a it's another business can you can you buy uh buy land a truck to to park trucks and maybe it's another business for you guys yeah, and we we have that. We actually created a truck parking. We had a truck parking right outside of uh, Charlotte. We had eight acres of uh, I one or I two 
uh, zoned so that we actually were, we turned it into a truck parking lot, but we ended up, we're in the process of selling it right now. And uh, the buyers were doing like a owner financing deal for the buyers. So, but it's, it's like 45 minutes outside of our office. So it was a little too far out. And that's why we decided to kind of sell it and maybe try to find something like a better location, if that makes any sense. But yeah. Yeah, it's great. Uh, Jordan, geographically speaking, uh, I guess like with Bob being from Charlotte, does that like make any kind of like, I know it does have some kind of influence on the buyer, but can you kind of tell us more about like how geographical, I guess, location uh, is for a trucking company could potentially affect like the, the I don't know, the evaluation or the, the acquisition process? Yeah, you know, I, I think it, it hurts and helps. So it's sometimes, you know, if, if, if you're in a spot, a geographic spot that, that buyers are looking for, um, I think you know there's an opportunity. I mean, maybe being in Charlotte, you're not going to get a lot of buyers from California, but um, you know, we're, we're located in Chicago and, and we work with businesses all around the country. So, you know, I, I, I don't think ge geography is, is that big a factor, but it, it sometimes helps if someone's specifically looking for a trucking company in Charlotte or in Dallas or, you know, in, in Denver, then there's opportunities there for, for, you know, that group to, to go to market. Definitely. I feel like Charlotte would be a pretty, uh, pretty good area right now. Cause when I visited Charlotte back in March, there's so many new uh, industrial like warehouses and parks being built due to like the pop a lot of uh well, they have a booming population though there's a lot of people moving to Charlotte so it might might have some kind of interest from like a long term buyer yeah, yeah. Like Charlotte, it's Charlotte right. Charlotte Atlanta Houston those are all kind of hot markets right now yeah cool. yeah it's right like for for trucking it's or I guess the industrial it's going like right outside of Charlotte so we have like the four uh, the outer loop and it's right outside the outer loop that they're building like massive warehouses and everything actually that's funny that you said like towards atlanta but everything from charlotte going towards atlanta like spartanburg area greenville area that area is booming with industrial stuff so yeah yeah very interesting uh i'm wondering uh jordan what are what are you uh predicting the market to look like uh from like the selling and buying side of things for the next uh year or so should it more or less stay the same yeah, I think we're gonna have a small recession. I, you know, I think it's been baked into the market forever, and so I think it's maybe we're in the middle of it. I, you know, I don't depends, on, you know, what <laughs> what you read or what you watch, but sure. I think things are gonna stay the same for probably the next twelve months, and I think small deals will continue to get done, and probably the bigger deals just just aren't gonna happen just because of the interest rates, and so you know, it, it's good for us. We 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 are small to mid size firm we work with you know trucking companies and manufacturing companies on you know a million to 10 million of EBITDA and five to 100 million of revenue so it's a great time for us we're you know we're, we're very busy and and seeing a lot of the smaller deals get done awesome nice. um perfect uh, jordan uh, real quick before we wrap up if anyone listening to the podcast is interested in selling their business uh should they reach out to you sure uh jordan at caberhill.com or phone number, maybe Paul can send out my phone number. I can give it now, 312-961-9043. Awesome. Uh, Jordan, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I learned a lot. I had a great time. I'm sure Bob did too. Uh, I did too, yeah. I actually yeah. wanted to learn about this, so it's very interesting to actually hear this. And I'll I'll definitely contact with you. And I, if you have the time, I mean, I'm not looking to sell because we're not really looking to sell it because we still want to, you know, grow a little bit more, even though it's it's super tough. But um, would definitely be interesting to see, you know, like w if we're even in that right spot or what our potential, I guess, would be. So, of course, happy yeah. to give you feedback. Thanks for having me. This was it was a great uh, morning, so I really appreciate your time. Thanks for tuning in to the Daily Freight Caviar Podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast or if you didn't, leave a review. Let me know what you think. I appreciate any feedback. If you'd like to have more Freight Caviar content, go to FreightCaviar.com and subscribe to my email newsletter.